And as you all know, that can take a second or two. And I'm going to be changing screens every once in a while. Um, so you all should see my first slide now. Please give me a hands up if you do. I see it. Everybody sees it. OK, then we can go ahead and start. Um, what is uh, a camera slider? Um, basically, it helps you do smooth video, and it helps you do really cool time lapses. You can use it for other things, too. I don't have mine programmed to do that. That's version two. But uh, things like panoramas or multi-row panoramas, we'll incorporate that as we, as we do version two. But for right now, um, you know, smooth video uh, and, and time lapses. And to boil it down, the, you know, the picture uh, is, is on your right. That's the machine that I built. Uh, it has three axes, uh, you know, moving left to right. Um, the uh, middle part of the machine uh, moves the camera, uh, you know, on, on the Y axis, it's, it's a pan. It just moves, you know, points it left and right. And then the, the axis in, in the middle, uh, I'll use the pointer it's right here in the middle, you know, moves it up or down. So uh, that's why they call it three axis. Um, little bit about inspiration uh, for this for this project uh, you know I Jim, do, is that you on the left uh, no it's not it's not but this your is, name under it this is a photographer that you should know Daryl uh, you know as I did the project I realized well I need a name for this machine and uh, a lot of my landscape is uh, you know, he's my idol, uh, Ansel Adams. So I decided to call the slider the, the Ansel. And, uh, you know, little did we know that Ansel actually used a camera slider. And it was a really big model, you know. And he could put his 8x10 camera on there. And I don't know if you call it a three-axis, but it certainly moved, you know, on two axes uh, uh, in a plane. So... Uh, you know, that's part of the inspiration. A uh, bunch of other things, though. Uh, a really old film from 1982 called Koyana Squatsi. Has anybody heard of that? Uh, this is small group, so... Yeah, yes. Yeah, has anybody seen it? <laughs> yeah, I think I have. And I also okay. have this part of the soundtrack. Right. The, the music is fantastic. Uh, it's all a play on time. And it's a, a Hopi Indian word, which means life out of balance. Um, but it uses, you know, sped up video and also time lapse video almost exclusively throughout the, the hour and a half of the film. There's no, uh, no talking, no narrative, anything like that. It's just you're, you're looking at stuff and it's really, really cool. So, uh, you know, seeing the time lapses in that was part of the uh, inspiration. Uh, for this. Uh, another part of the inspiration was the image you see on the right, the kind of red and blue one. And those are some video robots that my son-in-law uh, uses in his company, Right Media. And those of us that did the little video thing, you know, saw these robots, uh, you know, in their studio. They're really, really cool. And they're really, really expensive. They're not three axis, they're six axis. You got, you know, lots more moving parts in these guys. The big one on the right is about a million dollar machine and uh, it's called a Bolt. Uh, the one on the left is a Bolt Junior and it's excess of a half a million dollar machine. And they they're run on tracks. They're large. They run on tracks and they move fast. They can move, uh, the Bolt I think can move up to about 12 meters per second along the track. So these are big dangerous machines. Is that um, what like Amazon's using now to pick? No, no. These are strictly for video. Okay, uh, it's to move cameras quickly to cover things that you couldn't move if you were a human being. Is what it boils down to. And uh, to I'll, I'll give everybody a link to the Right Media website, and you can see examples of the kinds of things that they they shoot with this. Uh, the folks that were in on the video class, you've already seen some examples of that. Um, now I'm going to uh, 
switch my share over to some video. And I'm doing that now, so be patient. So you should see those machines on the screen. And I'll start the video and you'll hear them and see them moving. This is not, this is just a short clip when they were planning a shoot with these. Uh, for the actual shoot, they would have the cameras on them. And sometimes the cameras look at each other and sometimes they look back at, uh, at a different camera. Okay. Uh, we're going to switch back for a while to the slides. And then later on, we'll switch back to video. I've tried to minimize these, uh, the switching that's going on here. But uh, anyway, that's, you know, the kind of main inspirations. Um, as I was telling some folks before, everybody got on live. Uh, I'm doing a lot of video stuff now for the church. Uh, it's basically a, a live stream of our service every week, and it's a team of people, not just me. So uh, the several hours that it takes to do that every week pretty much burn me out on on video, doing video of my own. But I'm still, you know, pursuing this project. Okay. Um, this project is all about what I learned doing it. And when we get to the end, I'll show you a bunch of examples, some you know, short video clips of, of time lapses and video with sound uh, of results. But these are the basic steps that I went through in this project. I decided I wanted to do it. I was inspired by these robots and I was expire, inspired by Koyana Squatsi, et cetera. But I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So first step was to, you know, find some designs out there that would be doable by me, okay, build on previous designs. I knew in doing this that uh, I would have to learn some electronics and programming. The reason I would have to learn this, I did some programming in college. That was long, long ago in Fortran and BASIC. Uh, now it's a world of C++, et cetera. The other thing there is that uh, I did take an electrical engineering course in college and I made a C in it. It was all about uh, transistors and op amps and NOR gates and AND gates and things that I completely forgot and didn't really understand then. That's why I made the C. So I knew I'd have to learn some electronics, okay? Uh, third step is basically build uh, the electronics from some designs I found out there and, uh, and make some improvements to that. Uh, and I knew that would require a lot of uh, programming to make those improvements. So the main improvement I did on, on the basic designs, and I'll show you those too, was to uh, add complete control of, uh, of time, of the duration of what you're, what you're shooting. Basically, when you use this slider, uh, you put it at a start position, you're pointing your camera at a particular place, and you choose your end position where you're gonna be pointing the camera at another place, okay? And then it moves slowly in between until those, until that coincides with the second position. Um, next step was gonna to be to build the actual physical slider. And I knew going in that uh, in prototyping electronics and, and building all that, it wasn't gonna be very portable. So I'd have to figure out a way to make it portable, to shrink the electronics, um, put those in a box and be able to move it around, take it out in the field, uh, really, you know, make it a tool I could, could use most anywhere. And of course, any project like this where you have a lot of different pieces, you got to put those pieces together and, uh, and, and make them all work. So the first step was build on previous designs. What I did was go on YouTube. I couldn't have done any of this without some great teachers on YouTube. And I must have looked at 25 or 30 different camera slider build projects on YouTube. Uh, most of them were single axis or maybe two axes. And you know, you had maybe 10 or 12 that were three axis sliders. And I picked out two of them where I really liked the design. And I basically decided, well, I'm gonna, you know, make a Frankenstein. I'm gonna combine those designs and get something closer to what I could both build and, you know, kind of have a chance to, to make work. This first one from, from a guy named Isaac879 on YouTube. Uh, I really liked the, the rail that he used and the supports for the rail, the big black thing on the right. 
And his design for the, the carriage for the camera was really, really cool, but he designed it for his camera and it wouldn't have fit my camera, which meant if I used that design, I would have to redesign a lot of those parts, which are, you know, he designed to, to 3D print. So, you know, I didn't know how to do that. So um, basically the, the other design that I thought was really pretty good um, was this guy that d does how-to mechatronics on YouTube. And it's a really similar looking carriage for the camera, um, the, the horizontal rail, all that was, was kind of different. But I looked at them, I said, yeah, I can, I can put those two designs together. So what I came up with, I used the, the top part of this one that I'm circling with the mouse. And then the previous one, I used the bottom part. So um, this is my second, you know, um, psychological stage of the project. Let's say it that way. The first one was the inspiration. And then this one is the preparation. So you got to have some kind of design to, to start with. So as we go through the talk, you'll see these yellow balloons every once in a while. And those are the psychological pro project stages. And I'll just list those here real quick. They're the shuns, the inspiration, preparation, perspiration, desperation. A lot of these you use multiple times, particularly the desperation. So you got to throw determination in there. And finally, you get, you know, to the end and see some product and, and that satisfaction. Okay. Into hey, the work. Yes, sir. Sorry, Rob. So in light of the fact you guys see electronics and don't remember much of it, and you remember the punch cards from Fortran, all that ancient stuff. Uh, I, you know, and all that inspiration about how long did it take you from start to finish to complete this uh, project? Just about in your range, just how long did it take about? Yeah, start to finish from, you know, inspiration to taking it out to field test, hmm. um, about six months. Okay. And about three of that was just learning the electronics and, and programming then kind of another month to build the physical apparatus and another month to integrate it. We'll, we'll get it. We'll get all into that. Um, okay. I'll okay. mention pretty much all, all those people, things. People so, should also <laughs> know that Jim has an undergraduate degree from MIT. Including a, a C in electrical engineering. Jim, quick, quick question, please. Sure. Uh, what is different from what you have right now? And I know it's better. In the camera itself, you can have multi-point forecasting. You can pre-select it where you want to shoot and when. And uh, what is different from that and your sliding? Well, in using the slider, like I said, starting out, it's primarily for smooth video. You know, whenever you move the camera, um, try to move it handheld, uh, you're always going to get some shake involved. And that really takes that out of the equation. It enables you to move that camera from point A to point B smoothly. And that's essential for uh, lots of kinds of video and it's absolutely essential for time-lapse. So, you know, those are the two, two main applications. you right. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, I'll go through this electronics and programming pretty quickly, and people that want to dive in and look at the program, we can share that with you. But again, without YouTube, none of this would have been possible. I found a guy on YouTube named Paul McWhirr, who had a series of basic hobbyist electronic lessons using uh, this little um, microcontroller called the Arduino Uno. And you see over there, uh, the left image where it says, you know, this is the old classic Arduino Uno. Um, and the, the chip that it runs on, there's a little bit closer view of that at the bottom of the screen. It's the Atmega 328P. Anyway, Paul McWhirter had this course, 69 lessons, using this starter kit that I also bought over here. Okay. And that basically has all the little little parts that you, you would use, LEDs, et cetera. I'll go through those. And actually went through most of those lessons over almost a two-month period. I ended up doing a, roughly 50 lessons. You kind of get to a point to where it's, it's really just a, a new component that you're learning how to use. And it's mainly the programming. So 
there were components that I didn't need for this project. So I kind of quit it about, uh, about less than 50. I just did it, you know, a half hour a day. Some hours I was psyched up and did an hour, but it was a lot of preparation and a lot of perspiration learning how to use various components and how to program the microcontroller for those components. And I'm going to show just a bunch of examples of, of these kinds of components. On the left, we see some LEDs and resistors. You got to use the resistor or you burn out the LED and you got to you learn how to turn it off and on, You uh, things like that. Things that are real simple, like a, a switch, okay, on the right. Uh, that's the switch that I ended up using for a limit switch for the, the x-axis. You know, how to uh, keep track of times the switch is pushed, et cetera, that kind of thing. Uh, this fancy little um, thing with the silver knob in the middle, it's a potentiometer. And potentiometer is a fancy word for a variable resistor. So uh, you use the analog pins of that Arduino to read a, a voltage that varies according to that resistance and that turns that into a, a digital number. And again, there's programming associated with, with each of those well, pieces. Jim, is it true that the Arduinos work best if you drink wine while working with them? That's not true at all. Beer, they're, they're beer and hard liquor are, are clearly the best. Wine, I don't think wine would work at all. But they're Italian computers. Yeah, it was designed in Italy, and it's uh, it's open source. So a lot of different companies uh, make the Arduino. I have to go back to, I guess. Uh, this one was not made by Arduino, so it's actually a little bit cheaper. But, you know, lots of companies make them. They use the open source design, and um, they're very inexpensive. You know, seven bucks, ten bucks. Um, the original from the Arduino company is about 20 bucks. So it's, it's, you know, all these components are, a lot of them in, are in the range of 59 cents to $2 is what it boils down to, but they do add up. And we'll talk about that later too. A couple more components, the big knob on the right, we've all used a joystick before, particularly if you've played any kind of computer game. Well, in this application, they use the joystick to control the Y axis, which is the pan, and then the Z axis, which is, which is the tilt. Um, the thing, on the left is a rotary encoder. All that does is count electronic pulses. Well, you use the software to count those pulses, but it has lots of contacts in there. So as you turn, uh, turn that around 360 degrees, you get multiple contacts and a little electrical signal that you can count and keep track of. So we use that for uh, setting the duration, setting the time uh, in the project, okay. Lots of cool little projects uh, just to learn this stuff. And well, I'll show a short video of each of those two. Um, well, the lower left is a uh, liquid crystal display. Learned how to you know, connect that to the Arduino. Requires uh, roughly 10 pins to connect it. The upper left, how to control those LEDs, lots of flashing lights, but uh, used a little chip called a shift register so instead of requiring um, eight pins for eight LEDs, you just need two pins to send the signals to the shift register, and then it tells it where to send the signal to the eight. Um, on the right, uh, running motors, okay? Uh, these are stepper motors that are used to move the axis of the slider. So again, here I was just learning how to do this stuff, and we'll show some short videos of those two. But really learning the, the stepper motors and how to control them and what they can do and um, utilizing an available library to be able to run three step stepper motors simultaneously was kind of the key part uh, of the project. Um, hey, real quick a question, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so is the UNO a general application kind of learning or a thing like the Raspberry Pi? Are they somewhat similar? Why did you go with this versus something else? Oh, that's a super question. There's lots of different microcontrollers out there with lots of different capabilities. And this is really the beginner level. Uh, has just a small amount of memory. I believe it's 32K um, program 
uh, memory and then 2K of, of core memory. So you can't put, you know, a huge program on the thing and it runs relatively slowly, 14 megahertz. Um, the Raspberry Pi has order of magnitudes, more processing power than this, but it's something that's just not, you know, that's overkill for what I was doing. Uh, my version two, I'm going to use uh, a microprocessor processor called an ESP32, and it's a it's 32 bit, and uh, has you know a lot more memory, and it runs a lot faster, and it'll be able to handle the um, big increase in amount of software that I have to do for 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 version two. Okay, so part Sorry, of what, yeah, the the um. Ahead, Raspberry Pi can talk to Arduino, and there's a Raspberry Pi mm -hmm. similar thing to the Uno, which is called Pico. Right. It, Microcontroller. Yeah, I, yeah, there's a whole I, ecosystem of these microprocessors and microcomputers out there. Ras the Raspberry Pi is really considered a microcomputer, uh, but there's no, you know, there's no fast dividing line between those. But it's, uh, you know, more memory and more speed and ability to handle more devices with more inputs and outputs are the main differences. So Jim, go ahead. Another question. Uh, how did you, I mean, of course, if one is not electronic savvy or has limited knowledge, how did you determine the compatibility between all these, all the different parts, or, you know, compatibility, you know, because. Yeah. Like, yeah. like I said, Mike, I started with, designs that were out there okay okay so i'm using you know same or similar parts to what were used um uh, in um the the how-to mechatronics uh -huh. mainly um but you know I'll, I'll cover some of those differences too as we go along so just a little bit right. more uh electronics to go uh okay. one thing really important with these stepper motors is you have to have something called a, a stepper driver and um the um, well, let me talk a little bit more about the motors before I go to the driver. It's, there's different kinds of motors. Uh, there's like a, a regular DC motor. You apply current to it and it turn, turns round and round. Okay. Well, these stepper motors, basically each time you send them a signal, they move one step. And for these particular motors, there's 200 steps in one revolution. So to go 360 degrees, it takes it 200 steps. Okay. Uh, that's not a very fine resolution for an application like pointing a camera, and thus the importance of these stepper motor controllers, which is the, it's the purple thing with the, uh, the fins on it, the uh, thermal uh, dissipation unit on there. That, uh, it allows you to do a lot of things with those motors, but one important thing is what's called micro-stepping, Okay. The motors there on the left will normally do 200 steps in a revolution. Well, this particular um, stepper driver, uh, uh, it's a it has a part number, it's with 8825, but it allows 16 times micro-stepping. So instead of 200 steps in a revolution, you can get 3,200 steps in a revolution. So it's a much finer uh, gradation of moving uh, that axle that you're controlling the, um, the, the three axes of the, uh, of the slider with. So um, that's probably more detailed than you want, but that's as detailed as I'm going to get. Okay. Um, and working with the stepper motors, uh, you can either wire them up directly, but they have a little thing um, called a stepper motor shield, really a, a CNC shield for computer numerically control. And this little red board is basically where you put the stepper controllers. And it looks complicated, but it's really just a capacitor and connections. So it's just a way to keep the connections uh, simplified. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a bit, a bit more about that later too. It really made designing the shrunk electronics a lot easier because I didn't have to design this. I could just use it right off the shelf. So um, basically this unit gets a signal from the Arduino, the microcontroller, um, the stepper driver 
then sends that signal out these wires to the stepper motor and telling it what to do. So um, let's see. Okay. Um, at this point, that's really kind of all the basic electronics uh, I wanted to, to cover. And uh, let's just watch uh, a handful of these very short videos. I'm gonna change to the video program, just be patient with the share, okay. Everybody see a black screen. That's a, that's a, that's a yep. I, I take that, I take that as a yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. I'm just going to show some quick examples. Okay. I mentioned this one a while ago, making the LEDs blink. What this thing is, is a, what's called a binary counter. And so you're using the Arduino to count in binary. And you remember old movies that had computers in them, you'd always see these flashing blinking lights. Well, this is pretty much what you were, what you were seeing. Um, I'll use the cursor to point at it, but this, this first LED is one, the second one is two, the next one four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128. You add all those up, you can count from zero to 255. And it's a pretty exciting, okay? If you don't think it's exciting, just watch the blinking lights and all of a sudden you'll be to 255. And this was something that was not strictly required for the project, but it really helped to understand how to operate uh, LEDs. Once they're all lit up, you're at 255, okay? Next little quick project was learning how to use and program a liquid crystal display. And um, cool thing about these is that they're, they're found in all kinds of, of electronics. They're just ubiquitous, kind of used everywhere. The project was basically um, let your Arduino be a calculator and the LCD display uh, be your, your interface. You would enter numbers actually using the keyboard of the uh, computer that's connected to the, the Arduino, but the Arduino would do the calculation. So the first thing that happens, it asks you to enter the first number. Again, you're using the computer keyboard, that's 78. It asks you to enter the second number. And I get to that eventually 64, then it asks you to enter the operation. And uh, um, I decided I wanted to be, have my operations in reverse Polish notation. Everybody gets a good laugh out of that. Normally we put our operation between the two numbers, reverse Polish notation puts your operation after the numbers. So uh, you basically enter the operation, the, the asterisk that will show up here is the, the times and then it tells you the answer. And there you go, 78 times 64 is 49.92. Okay, next little project. Again, spent a lot of time learning about stepper motors. This was the first time I put more than one stepper motor running um, and using the, the little CNC shield to, to run those. It's real simple, you tell one motor to move and the other motor to move and to, to do it twice. Jim, why the name Stafford Motor? What makes it unique? Because they, because they move in discrete steps. Uh, okay. Like I mentioned a while ago, these particular motors, it takes 200 steps to do one revolution. Um, you know, different sizes of motors will take different sizes of steps, but this is this is one that's called a NEMA 17, and that's pretty standard for them is 200 steps per revolution. The reason I only tested two motors at this point, you'll see some more of the stepper motor drivers over here. Those are ones that I broke uh, trying to set the reference voltage on them. So stuff like that happens uh, as well. Right. All right. Okay. I believe stepper motors are inside many lenses that do autofocus. I think you're correct. I think you're correct. Let's see. 
Oh. And maybe in inkjet printers. I'm not sure. Anybody they, are used, they are used a lot in inkjet printers. Yeah. yeah. In fact, this particular shield that's used widely for uh, to replace uh, electronics, to replace those stepper motor drivers. Uh, it's used as a repair part for uh, both CNC machines, computer numerically controlled, and for uh, for uh, for printers. So you're absolutely right about that. Okay, let's go ahead and that's the end of that one. Okay, we'll do one more and then go back to the to the slide presentation. Uh, this is the setup of electronics for uh, the design by the how-to mechatronics guy. And again, I only use two motors because I, at that time I had ordered some more stepper drivers, but uh, this is basically what I needed to build. Uh, I felt I knew enough of the electronics and, and, and program to actually build this. So this is pretty short, but I was just so happy this to see that this thing worked. This is set up with two motors and it actually works. So we see it running the two motors simultaneously. Could have done three if I had three. And you'll also notice that it's using the 200 steps rather than the um, 16 times micro stepping. Okay. Now I'm going to switch back to. The slides again and we'll come back to, to videos again later let's see i'm gonna have to something is not right here mike well maybe when generally what i do in these cases is just i shut off share screen go right back to where i was and restart yeah i think it's back now Oh, is it back? Okay. Sometimes no, there's a... No, it's not. Okay. Maybe I need to stop share. Yeah, and restart it again. That's not unusual to have to do that. Okay. We'll stop share momentarily. I knew this yeah. was going to happen. Then reshare. Yeah. I can I can sing happy birthday to Don while we're waiting. Is it Don's birthday? I think yeah. it's very soon. Yeah, okay. We're... Let's see. Yeah, I'm seeing the built and we, test slider. We, we, we did those. But the about my birthday, I just turned 82 in the middle of the month, and I don't look a day over 81. It's my my view. That's Other right. And, <laughs> and Don, when you turn down the lights even more, you get younger every time. Happy birthday, Don. I appreciate y'all's patience with this. This is the first time we've tried really switching back and forth a bunch of times between programs. And I'm going to have to uh, and try sharing again. Yeah, I tried that. And now. Whoa. Okay, back to try sharing again. Okay, let's try this. Okay, I'm, I'm seeing all the different slides. Yeah, but it won't let me go to slideshow. So it's locked up. Let me... You may have to just I go one at no, I can't. There we go. Now, it, 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 I think it just caught up. Okay. Yeah, yeah you have a buffer issue, probably. Like yeah, a it's a buffer issue. Okay. Um, all right. The last stuff on the electronics was just incorporating the improvements that I wanted to make. And that is using the rotary encoder to set your duration, your time, and also using the LCD display to... Um, as part of the user interface so you can see what time you're actually setting. Um, 
to do that, to incorporate the LCD, I was not going to have enough pins on the Arduino to connect the LCD the, the first way I showed it set up. But luckily, there's a little thing called an I2C, which means Inner Integrated Circuit Communication. And that's this little, little blackboard uh, on the right hand of your screen. Uh, but it allows you to connect to the Arduino with just two pins. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm still seeing all the different slides of the program. Like, I'm not seeing a single slide. I'm seeing all of them. You're seeing all of them. Yep. Okay. We're, we're, we're stuck in something that's like an infinite loop here. Um, well, I really don't know what to Slide do. program, just kind of go one picture at a time kind of thing. That's what I'm trying to do. Okay, I thought so. Yeah, yeah. Well, I will. Leave, we'll let you work out. You'll we'll let you work it out. And let me just reannounce to everybody. Keep going, Jim. Just do what you need to do to try to get it to rock. Again, to everybody, we're having the salon uh, uh, event Monday. It's at, starts at eight p.m. That's this Monday. Winners will be announced. I'm going to get put together a slideshow with all the bells and the whistles and the whole works. And all all the images placed in the salon or entered in the salon will be shown. And during that slideshow, the winners will be subtly and surprisingly interspersed within the slideshow. So they'll be announced in within the slideshow. And then afterwards, hopefully I'm going to get a couple judges, maybe one to one or even three would be great of the judges that decided the salon. And they'll be able to share their thoughts about some of the images, winning or not. And then we'll just, you know, just pick out images, whether they got ribbons or not, just kind of say, hey, I really like that one. Here's why kind of thing. So but anyway, I thought I'd let y'all know, but Jim, I now I see the full slide, so we're good. Okay, I think we're good if I can change slides. Well, I still can't change slides. Let me completely close the slide program. We tested all this beforehand, Mike and I did, and this didn't happen, so. Uh, and now I see the other slide, Jim, so it did switch. Yeah, it finally did. Okay, there we go. Okay. All right. I was just we're finishing telling enough about uh, the I2C, so that way the Arduino had enough pins. Again, it's just uh, it's, it's trying to catch up. So this step, the electronics was pretty easy. It's not that hard setting it up. It's writing the, uh, the programming, the software that really took the time. And it took several steps. First was to just simply count the number of steps as you turn that rotary encoder, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then basically change that into seconds. So you're counting one, two, three, four, five, six seconds. But I went all the way up to 24 hours. So I forgot how many seconds that is. It's like 24,000 and something. And then the next step is just to do the math, convert those seconds into hours, minutes, and seconds. So any kind of programming is like that. It's just very, very simple steps that you have to do one after the other. Of course, if you get one wrong, um, you know, you got to got to figure it out and of course also use the lcd display for some of the other uh, other instructions for for really how to to operate the device okay this is just example of the uh, programming this is like recurring perspiration and desperation and um it's like over on the left there's a bunch of stuff converting seconds to hours, minutes, and seconds, all those lines right there. Over on the right, some things I added were able to move the x-axis faster if you wanted to. Just kind of little bitty refinements. Okay. What program language did you use? What program uh, uh, pretty much all these um, small microcontrollers like the Arduino use C++. All right. Okay, whereas your... Um, you know, anything bigger is going to probably use Python. Uh, it's just that C++, it takes more lines to do, lines of code to do what you want, but it runs uh, a lot more efficiently, and um, you really don't need as much memory uh, for it. So yeah. uh, anyway, that's as much detail as we go on to that. So all these electronic pieces are put together, and, you know, Eureka, it all works. It's fantastic. So now I'm to the point of let's actually build the physical apparatus. But realizing at this point is that this mess of electronics on the table is not very portable. So I know I've got, you know, two more stages to the project after I build the physical device. And those two stages would be, you know, shrink those electronics down and put them in a box. 
So a few slides just on the physical bill. The top part of it is just basic woodworking things. You know, there's no really complicated parts. There was a lot of real fine drilling and a drill press, which I already had, uh, was perfect for that. You got to get your holes in exactly the right place and you have to have them countersunk correctly and they all have to line up, you know, from piece to piece. So, you know, that took a couple of weeks to uh, kind of do that part of it. Um, you know, and along with it, we also tested some of the mechanical parts of it. Um, really with the stepper motor, you know, originally you get 200 steps when you use the stepper motor driver um, at 16 micro steps, then you get 3,200. But if you really want more steps than that for your revolution, you need to use some step, step up gears. So, uh, you know, physically tested that. This gear has 20 teeth, this gear has 60 teeth. So basically it takes three times as many steps to turn that one all the way around. So instead of 3,200, it'll be 9,600 steps. So you get a lot finer way to point your camera and that kind of gear we used on, on two of the axes, okay. Um, the bottom half of the slider, really the whole X-axis build was, 3D printed parts. And my son has a really good 3D printer that got him, you know, several Christmases ago. So he helped with the, the printing of those parts. Uh, a lot of it's real simple, uh, just to support for the rail that, that forms the X axis. And then the carriage that runs along the, the X axis that also holds the motor. And then the top part that you see the, the bolts there for uh, attaches to. So then you put the whole thing together. Uh, you know, that was not too hard too. And the only real modification I had to make to the, the bottom part was just to add this little piece that you see in the picture on the right, because the leg that holds up the rail was not tall enough to contact the limit switch. When the carriage runs all the way, all the way to the end, it needs to know when it gets to the end. So I used a, you know, a simple switch to contact that in. And so that's a, a little simple part that we added uh, to, make, to make that work. Uh, obviously, when you get to this point, you've got the physical bill, you've got the electronic bill, and you put it all together. So uh, basically, you've got this big mess on the left sitting on the table. Uh, the two pictures are to, to show all of it because it doesn't really fit into one part. And uh, a little bit of the where the motor uh, for the z-axis fits into the system. A um, few more details. Uh, this is the x-axis motor and this is the belt that uh, the x-axis moves by this tooth gear. Uh, this is the limit switch on the lower left and um, a little bit more close-up view uh, of the carriage the x-axis on the bottom, z-axis on the right, and you can't really see the motor for the y-axis. It's behind the wooden parts right there. Okay, so at this point, you plug it all in, and most of it works. You troubleshoot until you get it all to work. Okay, you got it all working, and of course, the next step, well, it works without a camera on it. Let's put a camera on it and see if it really works. So we did that. Uh, another little detail there, I did uh, buy a um, uh, little mount with a plate to put on the, on the bottom of the camera, a quick release mount. And to make the camera end up in exactly the right spot, it needed a little spacer. So we, we 3D printed that. But the key thing designing here is so that you're, uh, the center of the camera is right above your your y-axis, I'm running the mouse up through there, and the center is also centered on the z-axis. You want the nodal point of the camera, preferably exactly on those axes. Uh, got it pretty close, I think, in this case. So, um, and after you put the camera on it, you got to try it out and see if that really works. You hey, know, so Jim, I, isn't the, the nodal point going to vary with the lens that you use? Uh, absolutely. That's why I said it, uh, approximately. And, um, you know, I put some holes in the, um, you know, the y-axis mount here so you can 
if you use it, you know, a heavier lens, things like that. So you can vary that a little bit. Um, but as, you know, as long as what you're shooting is pretty far away, as long as you're close to the nodal point, you're pretty good. If things are, are, are close, you need to have it exact. Does that help, Daryl? Okay, I assume yes. that helped. I assume yes. that that helped, Daryl. Okay, yeah. Jim. Right. I got, Jim, I got a question, please. Certainly. Uh, years ago, I built something that did focus stacking on film. It was called a light scanning photo micrography. I had. All right. Um, old slide projectors, film strip projectors that I modified. And instead of a slide, they had a gate in them, which was a narrow slit that the light went through. Mm -hmm. And I had three of these projectors on around the subject, about less than a foot away from the subject, pointing towards the subject, which would be in the middle. And the subject or specimen for the photography was on an elevator, a little right. elevator. And it, in a dark room, it moved the specimen up through the sheet of light. And on a continuous exposure of 30 seconds or more, it would paint the paint your subject. specimen yeah. with this sheet of light. And it'd be recorded by the lens, which was pointing straight down at the elevator. And you'd think, well, that can't possibly be smooth and in focus. Well, yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But anyway, that was the forerunner of focus stacking, which requires a computer and digitized information. This was entirely analog. Well, anyway, part of this machine that I built had an elevator for the whole camera system so I could change the magnification, right. basically. And I drove it with, like you're showing here, these toothed gear wheels right and a tooth uh belt well i found here's my question finally i found that the tooth belt and tooth gears were very rough and caused vibration and everything else while it was moving now in my case i wasn't shooting while that was moving that was just to get the camera at the right height but anyway here you're doing it to move the camera during shooting right are you, how do you overcome the tendency of the tooth belt and tooth drive pulleys to vibrate? Um, I don't have a great answer for that. You know, the proper tension on them, and I've had that go south a couple of times, especially on the main x-axis belt, and have to, to reset that. Uh, built all the the pieces here so there's a little bit of play in it so if you need to adjust that tension that uh, you, you don't get slippage uh, on those teeth and then another issue is just the uh the torque of of the motors there's a limit to how heavy a camera and lens you can put on this because of the uh, you know whenever these axes move you could you know, off this vertical like they are here right now, you put additional torque on that motor. So that, that's another issue for slippage. But that's not a great answer to your question. Yeah. Jim, and, you can uh, use the... And as, as I get to the point where I show you where I took it out in the field and, you know, broke some things, uh, we, we can, you know, that, it, that, that speak to that. Because I had trouble with one of the axes and, you know, how I put it together and had to really look at it and put it back together right <laughs> so that it wouldn't, you know, tighten that axis too much as it moved. And that caused some, some vibration, some slipping. So, you know, there's other issues that you can have too, but I want to, I want to keep going here. Otherwise we're going to go too long. So, uh, you know, at this stage, you know, put the camera on it and the electronics are not portable. So the only thing I really had to, uh, to try that at that point was just do some video right where the, uh, the slider was sitting and, um, you know, we'll at this point show uh, a, a few more of the videos and, uh, and, and those first ones as well. So let me go back to the video program. 
Does everybody see the video program now? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, well, one more showing how the electronics work. This is the longest one, so just be patient through it, and I'll stop a couple times and just add some more narration to it. But basically, this is when I added, you know, controlling the time to it. And uh, The 3D camera slider uh, is nearly finished now. We've added several things. Actually, the electronics were nearly finished, and I was still working on the main thing is the LCD display for time and the rotary encoder here to set the time. See, I'll change it. The time changes as you move the encoder. I'll leave it at 30 seconds for this quick demonstration. So next I explain the basic operation of the thing and it's the same, you know, shrunk down into the box I put the electronics in. So this really tells you how to use the machine. Basic operation is this. We'll reset, which reloads the code in. When you reset the blue LED the X -axis flashes. The starts homing until it hits the limit switch that I'm going to set off. The motors need to know where they are, so uh, that's why it needs to, to do the homing. Then we set the end position by moving the x-axis to a new place. The terminology here, I called it the end position. It's wherever you, your camera starts out pointing. So you're going to set that x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis mm -hmm. to where you first want the camera pointed. to a new place. That's, That's the, the y. Right one. And then the other one. That's the z-axis. To a new place. Hit the set switch which is right there, the green button, and the red LED comes on, so the end position is set. Then we'll move the x-axis by turning the potentiometer. We'll do... Again, you're just moving your where your camera points to a new place. Three rotations. By moving all three axes. Okay, that's enough. We'll move the y-axis you see the just remember that the x-axis is moved by the potentiometer and the y and z axes are moved by the joystick white arrow moving. which is not showing okay and then we'll move the z-axis okay that'll then we'll hit the green button the set button again to Set the out position, the green LED comes on. Next step, we can change our, our time. Let's just move that to 40 seconds, just so it'll be, be different. Move back to the end position by pushing the set button again. We'll see all three axes move back to the end position quickly. And we'll hit the set button one more time to actually run. And they run at the chosen speed to last for the 40 seconds, and that's it. Okay, so that's basically all the electronics and motors, how the thing operates. This is a little quick video of testing out the uh, the gears to get those 9,600 steps per revolution for the y-axis and the z-axis. This is just a, a physical prototype of that. So you can see it moving really, really slowly. Okay. And this clip is really the first time Everything was put together, all the electronics, all the physical mechanism to test it and, and see if it worked. So we basically see the whole carriage moving right to left. That's the x-axis. The y-axis here slowly turning back toward the camera and the z-axis slowly pointing down. This is where your camera is, slowly pointing down. And you also see the bench power supply those motors are running at 12 volts and a little over 0.8 amps. 
Okay. When I got this working, I couldn't move the electronics. So uh, all I could shoot was whatever was in the room where I built this thing. So I put the camera on and did a couple of short videos, which you'll see now. And you can hear the stepper motors a little bit. And this is the camera with just a normal lens. I think I shot this at probably 50 or 60 millimeters, something like that. Just moving across the room, showing what's there. So anyway, it works with a camera on it. So that's the very first video from this product. This is the second one. I put a telephoto lens on just to see a little bit better, really how smooth is this gonna be. Showing some of the same things in the room, the little old telescope and some stuff on the side table. So I was pretty satisfied with that. Jim, those, that video you just showed was right. at the 200 steps or was it the 200 times 16? Uh, 200 times 16 for the x-axis, which would be 3,200. And then uh, with the gears for the y and z axis, so both those axes would be 9,600 per, per revolution. Okay, we're going to try again to switch back to the presentation, and I hope it doesn't lock us up on us again. Mine switched right back. Did everybody else's? Yes. Good. Okay. So we'll continue with that. So basically, everything's working. Okay, I can I can shoot, you know, pretty smooth video. Probably needs a little bit of work, but. Now I need to shrink those electronics down and put them in a box so that we can take it anywhere we want. So really a couple of steps to shrinking the electronics. Uh, first, obviously put them all on some kind of second board, uh, on some kind of circuit board, excuse me. And this is one that I had in the house. And also think about using, um, you know, a, a smaller microcontroller. Well, it turns out that there's a lot of designs for this Arduino Uno um, and there's another model called an Arduino Nano. Basically, it does the exact same thing, uh, but it's in a smaller form factor. Instead of uh, using this through-hole mounted chip that I just pointed to, oops, uh, on the big one, it uses a surface mount chip. So it's a lot smaller, okay? So this is a way to bring all those electronics into uh, a small piece and, and, and organize. Like I said, the main controller that you see on the left is a circuit mount chip of that, um, uh, what is it, 383P. Uh, the opposite side just shows the chip that controls the USB connection. So there's you know, multiple microprocessors involved in you know, any of these small devices, okay. Um, next thing was to design the printed circuit board, okay, which is something I had never done at all. I'd never done any of this at all. And little did I realize you couldn't just go in and design a printed circuit board. First, you have to design a working schematic that uh, has uh, electronic continuity through all the parts. And I didn't know how to do that either. So this, you know, uh, just doing this schematic probably took uh, a week and a half to get everything right. But it just shows all the parts, all the connections. The big thing in the middle is the Arduino Nano. These are the connections to the motors. Uh, these other things are the, um, well, let's see, the potentiometer, the uh, rotary encoder, etc. Okay. Anyway, it all has to connect together and work before you can actually go to designing the, the circuit board that you're gonna put everything on. Well, that part was relatively easy compared to the schematic, and I'm glad it was easy. So this is just some screenshots of um, a program called Easy EDA. EDA is Electronic Design Assistant. So you're learning another new piece of software here. And um, 
So it's got a learning curve to it too, but it wasn't too bad. The, it's a really simple circuit board. Your Arduino Nano goes here. These are resistors. These are connections to the LEDs. These are connections to the other things, and they're all labeled over here. But what I wanted to point out on the left is that circuit board designs can get really, really detailed and uh, not only two, two layers like this one, um, the layers come in, the connections on the board uh, going to the connectors are on both sides of the board. Okay, the ones on the top are these, uh, you know, the black ones that I'm pointing out. And the ones that are on the bottom are these, these blue ones. Okay, so whenever you shrink something down to, you know, on a plane, you're going to have to use multiple levels. But complex circuit boards is not unusual to have four levels, six levels. It, it goes on up. It get, gets really complicated. Okay. The key part of it is labeling everything so you know where to connect everything. And um, you'll see familiar things here that I talked about earlier. The joystick, the set button or the run button, the I2C connection to the liquid crystal display, the connections to the encoder. These are the connections to the motor drivers and uh, LEDs. Etc. So, uh, Jim, uh, I actually got most of those labels correct, except for one, and that caused some, you know, debugging problems. Go ahead, Daryl. Um, so, after you do this, do you send it off to a company, and then they send you the printed circuit board? Absolutely. The software is provided, you know, free by the same company. So, um, the next step is to to send it off. This is just larger shots of the entire circuit board because I was going to incorporate that motor driver. Uh, CNC shield on the right side. Um, the software is nice. You can look at it in 3D, how it's going to look with the pieces that you put on it. So that the, the blue one on the right shows that. I also realized that I wanted to do another small board because I didn't want the cables uh, going to the motors connected directly to the circuit board. I wanted to have a uh, a cable harness in essence and that green one at the bottom is what that is okay so yeah you uh send it off to a company called jlc pcb which is in china and it's really cheap it cost me ten dollars for both these boards and they gave me 10 copies of each board so it's they're almost free but you have to wait a week for them okay and Does that mean you're going to make a slider for all 10 people for free or something like that? We have extra ones and all of them incorporate that I labeled the green and red LED incorrectly, which, as I said, that caused some debugging problems later. But, <laughs> you know, mistakes are going to happen with this. The next thing, you got to take all the electronics and put them on the circuit board, which, you know, requires a lot of soldering, basically. So. Uh, over on the right, nothing is soldered. It's just, you know, how things are going to look. And I use these, what are called DuPont connectors, DuPont as in uh, uh, the DuPont company who came up with, with these. Uh, they're, they're evil, by the way. They're very evil. So uh, just set them on there, make sure things are going to fit. Uh, upwards of 150 solder points all through the thing, both for the circuit board and for the user interface that also connects to the circuit board, all the buttons and, and dials and LCD panel, all those connect back to the circuit board as well. And there's a learning curve to, to all this. I realized, well, yeah, I better do these uh, resistors first. Otherwise, it's gonna, they're going to be hard to get to. So, you know, you can have to start twice on, on a lot of things. So, Jim, on your soldering, how much did you pay for a soldering gun that you used to do this? I'll cover that later. I'm going to cover how much things cost. And that's the tools are part of it. So I'll cover that. So this is the completed uh, printed circuit board that you're going to put the Arduino Nano on. And basically all the rest is connections to everything else to keep it, keep it all organized. Okay. Um, once I got this, well, I actually started while... This was on, while the circuit board was on order. I started to design the box to put it in. And I knew that my son, Brian, could help me with 3D printing the box. Well, this is new software, too. I have no idea how to use 
3D design software. So I use the easiest one possible, which is free online called Tinkercad. Um, I started a little bit early, this little piece to contact the limit switch, that was pretty easy to design. You just had to have, you know, a little bit sticking up and a little bit to go on top of the leg and the two holes for the bolts, the right distance apart and the right diameter. So I was able to accomplish that one pretty easily. Okay. First try, it wasn't exactly right, but it worked. So we used it. Okay. Um, it was a lot harder designing this box. Okay. I started over three times. Okay. This was the first try and I realized, no, this is just, this is just not working. This is not how I want to attach the top of the box to the bottom of the box. This is the top first try LCD panel goes here. The buttons go here. The, um, oh boy. Um, you know, everything has its place, LEDs here, et cetera. So I started over completely again. I got pretty close on this one and I realized, oh man, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to start this box top over again, but I was smart this time. I saved all, I saved all the pieces. Okay. You know, I saved the, the start of the top before I cut all the holes out and added the post where things are going to be attached. And I did the same with this box. So when I started over the third time, which is, this is more or less the final version, I didn't have to start completely from scratch, but I had holes in wrong places and things were the wrong size and wrong heights. And, you know, anyway, three try, third time is the charm. And of course, to top it off, you need uh, a knob for the potentiometer that actually looks better. It's a tall potentiometer post. So I needed to design one that was taller. This one hasn't even been printed yet, but it's designed, it's ready, it's ready to go. Okay. You, Got my son to print the box, and on the right there, that's basically what it what it looks like. Um, I didn't put all the wires in at this point, but that, that's your user interface, you know, attached to it. Those are the the LEDs, the buttons on the right, uh, the potentiometer here, the joystick, and and the rotary encoder for the time right there. And then on the back, uh, that little hole is for the USB port to go to the Arduino Nano, um, which is great because you can hook it right up to your computer, download your program, you can make improvements to the program. And I, I did that many, many times uh, once I got it put together and decided I wanted to do some enhancements. Ended up not using this on off switch, but that's another story. So, um, you know, did all the soldering on the circuit board all the soldering and wiring for the, the user interface. So basically your user interface on the left there is ready to plug in and, and make it work. So you really have all the parts. It's just a matter of, of plugging them in. Um, the CNC shield with the motor drivers is, is here on the right with that upper left picture. Okay. Uh, these are the wires that come from the Arduino um, to that CNC shield that uh, send the signals to each stepper driver, you know, to tell the motor to move a step, okay? So you just wired it up one step at a time. Uh, this last step was all the <laughs> user interface being connected to the main circuit board. So here everything is connected except these last three, uh, three cables, which are uh, going from the, the motor drivers to the motors. They actually go to the um, uh, little board there that I, that I told you about. Okay. Uh, and this shows the motor connections. At that time, I had them labeled, you know, Z, Y, and X, because you got to keep those straight. Otherwise, the machine goes haywire. Uh, the most expensive part of this build, I decided not to design a, a power supply I wanted to go ahead and just get one off the shelf. So this is a lithium lithium ion battery and uh, got enough milliamp hours to where I can last, oh, minimum of six to eight hours if I want to do a long time lapse, okay? And uh, this works great. Uh, you know, I found one that has the 12 volts to go right to the motor controllers and also the USB connection to go uh, right to the uh, Arduino Nano, okay. So 
you know, this is the electronics all put together. And of course it's turned on and uh, it worked really the last step in the whole thing physically was to organize the cables going to the motors um, and to the limit switch, you know, going to the fit from the electronics, going to the physical device. So really you see that on the right. Um, th those cables are all in a, in a sheath and ran the cables, you know, up through the center of the uh, X, Y, and then the side of the Z axis so that you don't have cables wandering all around. Jim, did you have it to this stage when we went to, Shields Etheridge Farm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that time lapse I did there, the the lighting was too too harsh. I didn't include it in, in the ones I'm going to show you, but yeah. So you wonder what the the box looked like. You know, once you stuff all that in there, it looks like a rat's nest. And I'm sure that uh, um, Gennaro will be really impressed with this rat's nest and, and especially the design of the box. And I wish Michelle was here too. She's uh, an electrical engineer retired. She would be, you know, getting a good laugh from, from all of this. So, um, uh, you know, putting it all together basically makes it portable and you kind of get to your last psychological project stage. Ah, satisfaction. Let's, let's do some real stuff with this. So, uh, I want to show these videos real quick. We'll just not take a break because I'm not too far from the end. The, the videos will go pretty quick. So we're going to change back to the movies again. Y'all bear with me again. Zoom is not smart enough to go fast. And I'm trying to remember where I am in the movies. Okay. Yeah, the very next thing, I wanted to test the user interface. So I employed the best test you can do, which is a one and a half year old. Show how to work the joystick? Yeah. yeah. How about this one? He had just bumped his head by falling down and I needed something yeah, to distract him with. Buttons. But he loves pushing I buttons. I did not have anything connected at that point, but I counted that as a success of the user interface test. Um, Got it outside pretty much immediately after that. This is back in February. I decided to do a quick time lapse of um, the front of our house. We had nice clouds one day. This first video just shows the carriage running back to the start position. Because when you actually are doing the time lapse, uh, it's moving pretty slow. This first time lapse was 10 minutes altogether. With exposures every two seconds, you can hear the camera every two seconds. This is also during the time lapse. Again, this is about in the middle of it. I went from the, the left end to about three quarters of the way down the right end. Just took this little video with the iPhone to kind of show you what the scene was like. So now we'll see the very first time lapse using this equipment. And this was uh, February 9th, 2021. And it's got a still just to show the scene and then the time lapse. Everyone's supposed to applaud at this point. I did when I first did it. This is not great art or anything, but I also wanted to kind of uh, teach you, you guys a little bit, and I'll have a couple of slides at the end. What are the steps to doing a time lapse, even if you don't have uh, a slider? Because if your camera has an intervalometer, you're able to do it. Uh, basically, that was you know 10 minutes to take all those images, and that's shrunk down to 12 seconds. So that's 300 images total. Um, shoot them in RAW, convert them to JPEG, put them in your uh, video editing software, and um, and that's it, okay? Jim, that would have been really nice. That would have been a really good piece of equipment to have clips, for example, solar eclipse. Right, right. Yeah, so it's really good for photography in that respect. For those kinds of things or things similar to that, whether it's man-made, created, created on your own. Okay. 
So taking it out in the front yard was not enough to, to break it. So I enlisted Gary Gruby to go with me back out to Cochran Mill, where we did um, a field trip uh, workshop, I guess, back in January, late January. And uh, so we did some video clips out there and uh, we succeeded in breaking it too. So I'll tell all about that. So this first video clip from Cochran Mill, this has sound, so don't be alarmed. It shows the main falls. It goes from the stream up to the main falls. Very short clip. Next one is similar, starts at the top of the falls, going down to the bottom. And I thought both of those really turned out pretty well. Uh, this next one is a little bit longer. It's more like 20 some seconds. And it also starts below the falls and, and goes up to the middle of the falls. The attempt here was to really make the foreground prominent, which I did not succeed at. I really needed to get the camera lower and closer to the rocks and to see more of the 3D effect of the rocks moving with respect to one another. So I show this just as a, you know, a live and learn, you know, really frame more carefully get the things that you want in the middle of the image as prominent as you want them rather than just the start uh, and the finish. Okay. Now at this point, we realized we, we had broken it. The, the y-axis started messing up. It started tightening up. So the, the last clip from here really just uses the uh, x and z axes, but the y-axis is still messing up and causing some jiggling. So we considered that outing to be a, a great success in that we broke it and, uh, you know, found the vulnerable points and, you know, could go back and fix them, which we've obviously since done. Um, wanted to show a little bit better uh, with a tabletop video, the 3D kind of effect that you get with uh, the camera movement. So the stars here are Mr. Bill and Hammer and Hank. Um, and this one's real short, but just notice how the shrubbery moves and kind of the 3D effect that you get from the camera movement. Okay. Um, Very nice. Okay. We got about, th about three more videos and then we'll, you know, kind of uh, wrap it up with, you know, how to do a time lapse and questions and, and, and all that kind of stuff. The next one, I went back to the front of my house in the summertime, again, with some even nicer clouds. And I incorporated the mailbox to get a better 3D effect and they had uh, the crepe myrtle blooming, all that kind of thing. Again, this is a really short one, but... Uh, I think you'll enjoy this one. Much better. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to show, you know, a lot of the mess ups and kind of the learning curve with this. And this... Um, this next one, uh, I wanted to get something that the church could actually use, something that we can use for a product rather than just the front of the house or, yeah, we went to Cochrane Mill or something. So uh, this was like uh, early, mid-August or whatever uh, in front of First Baptist Decatur. So this is the raw one. And I've got another version of this that we're used in a, in a product. So we'll, we'll watch that one also, but let's just watch this uh, first one that doesn't have any sound, of course, because it's just the just the time lapse.
Okay, what'd y'all think of that one? Cool. Yeah. The clouds were really cooperative that day. They were moving two different directions, and I, I thought it was just gorgeous. And uh, I yeah, set this really one interesting. Yeah. I set this one up to be a total of 20 minutes. And I, I did the 20 minutes, but I decided to uh, make the end of it where the, the, the church is basically vertical because it uses a really wide angle lens. And I'll tell you the settings and all that. So this one ended up being 23 seconds long, 552 images. I was shooting for, for I believe it was 620 if it was 20 minutes. But anyway, I cut part of it off uh, at the end. That one cloud looked intimidating. So I could hit the church over, you know, it's kind of like yeah. heavy, very heavy. So, so do you set out to, to, um, uh, to get so many images in a second? Or is that, is that your, your guiding principle before you start these? Or Well, for a time like lapse, to... you're, you're compressing time. So right. um, it's fast, you know, fast motion, basically. So um, oh, I'll, right. okay. I'll, cover the, I'll cover the settings for this one. But um, we didn't practice this, Mike. I actually have another video that I need to bring up. And let me just see if I, this is the one that we turned into. Can you see it? Everybody see and hear that one? A community story? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Let me give a, a preface for it. Uh, the, the still image at the beginning was just a still pulled from the time lapse. And what we're going to see here, this community story, uh, a few weeks ago, we had the Decatur Book Festival. Um, it was which this year because of COVID we did totally at First Baptist Decatur, and we also did um, you know live stream of it. So we had you know a small audience inside the sanctuary, which was all socially distanced, everybody wearing masks, etc. But we we're able to have the festival. So one of the authors uh, actually gave a nice testimony uh, about how the church had impacted uh, her life, and um, so. Uh, we, you know, added a, a trailer to that, which is the time lapse. So what you'll see here is, uh, you know, a couple of frames telling, you know, who it is. She tells her quick story and then the time lapse, you know, with music and everything. So now I'm going to run it and see what you think of it. Carmen Didi's noted author. Yeah. Carmen Agrediti is the author, and, and then now she starts her and, testimony. Um, I was a kid um, growing up here in Decatur on Feld Avenue, down from Agnes Scott. Uh, my family was a family of refugees, and the community, we had about, I don't know, probably 100 families eventually of refugees, um, specifically in this case from Cuba, sponsored by this church. For, uh, Decatur First Baptist was our sponsor. Um, since then, this wonderful church now it has things like this event. This is where I first heard Anne Lamott. It's where I heard Temple Grandin. It's an extraordinary part of this community with a, a very storied, if you will let me use the word history. I've got an itching on the tips of my fingers. I've got a boiling in the back of my brain. I've got a hunger burning inside me. Cannot be denied. I've got a feeling that the father who made us when he was kindling in my veins he left a tiny spark that fire smoldering inside the spark of creation yeah, that's fantastic well thank you thank you but uh it was tough you know picking the music the music was also at the church that was during the summer when we had broadway sunday so um uh, I've kind of lost everything here. Okay. What are people seeing? Well, I'm, seeing all, I'm seeing all folders, a white screen, and two little spots where it says add, add folders and that's what I'm seeing. Video folders, removable storage, that kind of stuff. It's mostly a white screen. Okay, I'm trying to switch back to the... Do you back up to movies and TV? Hit the top left button? No, I'm seeing something different than what you are. I'm trying to... Time-lapse how-to. Time-lapse how-to. Yeah. Time how so I have two slides yeah. here. 
if you have a camera that has an intervalometer, you can do time lapses, okay, if you know how to use video editing software. So it's really not that hard. But the, the steps are this, you know, are set up and take the, the shots. Um, and for using the slider, what I like to do is go ahead and, and get my camera and pick the place uh, where that camera is going to be and where it's going to be pointed. I take a picture of that. Uh, to start and then where it's going to be and where it's going to be pointed to end. That way, when I set up the slider, I have those and I can tell that I'm uh, about right. And uh, if you're using the DSLR, something to think about too is make sure you're in that 16 to nine aspect ratio for, for video. Uh, shoot it in raw because that gives you more latitude. You can shoot them in JPEG, but you know, those bright clouds that were in the, the first Baptist Decatur, those blew out, you know, a couple of times, during it. Okay. I'm glad I had it in raw. So that it was just a couple times rather than 43 times. Okay. Uh, you want to set your camera, you know, for, for what it's going to do uh, for those church shots. It was very wide angle. That's why you got that perspective effect from the sign and the church uh, when it started out 14 millimeters. Anyway, those are the settings. Um, the intervalometer is basically the interval that you're going to use between shots uh, which I use, well, two seconds for both this one and the ones in front of the house, uh, and how many shots you're going to do, uh, those things combined will give you your, your duration. So here I took 620 shots for 20 minutes. Didn't use quite all of it, but uh, uh, if you do it with the slider, you know, you set uh, your end position for that start framing and then the end position for that start framing that you've already determined uh you start the camera and then the slider and and go from there um that's how you take them and then processing them as i said shoot everything in raw process edit all the raw images the same uh, most of you'll have software that you know you can uh, apply the same settings to, to all your images and, and do that. So that's what I did in this point. But things to be careful with, uh, you could pick uh, the brightest image. You could pick the darkest image. You could pick an average image. I picked one kind of toward the brightest on this one, but you want to use the same curve, same white black point. I used a little bit of highlight recovery. Um, that's about it. Again, the, the aspect ratio to put these individual still, all these still images, the six, you know, 580 or 600, whatever you end up with um, into DaVinci Resolve, they'll need to be saved as JPEGs. So, uh, but in Resolve, it's real easy to turn it uh, into a time-lapse. Uh, so that's about it. Um, we're basically at the end of what I have and getting to questions, but before we get to questions, I wanted to do credits. Now, some of these folks, I said, without YouTube, this was impossible because I could never have found all this stuff so quickly. I already mentioned how to mechatronics and Isaac 879 on the design of the slider, Paul McWhorter for all those lessons on the electronics and the Arduino. Uh, quite a few additional lessons. DroneBot Workshop is great stuff on Arduinos, ESP32s. I went into a lot of detail on stepper motors in order to understand that. I uh, didn't mention during the talk, but um, Tinkercad is done by Autodesk and has lots of good video tutorials on YouTube. There's lots of other <laughs> tutorials on <clears throat> Tinkercad for, you know, designing the box or any 3D object that you're going to print. But I found the Tinkercad editorials were much better, you know, shorter, right to the point how to do it not having to hunt through a bunch of stuff to find what you need. And I found the electronic design assistant uh, tutorials that JLC PCB had on their site were impossible to watch, but I lucked into finding this guy named Colin Hickey that had a series of three videos of how to design that printed circuit board using ED, um, easy EDA. And those were great. So I've mentioned, you know, version two, that'll probably not see fruition until sometime next year, but I'm using a lot of stuff from the, these other folks, curious scientists, et cetera. Uh, there's one site that's in German called Max Tech TV. This guy's videos are so good that you don't need to know German. 
it, he's showing you step by step and a lot of it's showing you the code that he's using too. So it's, so it's really, really good. Um, I know you've got a lot more questions and you had great questions uh, to begin with, but I think probably the main one I'll just preemptively answer is, you know, how much did this cost? Well, time-wise, um, I probably spent a couple of hundred hours over that six months of, of getting it working. But what I learned was, was magic. It kept me sane uh, during all this social distancing of the, uh, of the pandemic. So the electronic parts and the wood and all that stuff, about 250. I did make a list and kept track of everything. So it was about 250 bucks. And that's really cheap for the capability that I've got. I obviously needed uh, additional tools. Um, and I'll show the uh, picture of those in just a second. But I ended up with a lot of surplus components, a lot of these electronic components and um, even little mechanical things like the, the tooth gears and stuff. Uh, sometimes you can buy just one, but you may as well buy five or six. And any of the electronics, never buy just one of anything, get, get several. I've got some surplus components, believe me. So the main electronics tools you need, somebody asked a while ago about soldering iron. I, I sprung for a pretty nice soldering station that you see here on, on the right. It has a place for your spool. It has several of these little, uh, little tweezer things to hold the things you're soldering. The... Uh, it's adjustable. You can set your temperature. Uh, it's pretty high wattage. It'll come to temperature in about five or six seconds, even if you're going to four, 600 degrees, that kind of thing. It's essential. That was about $45. Okay. Uh, another essential thing is your bench power supply so that you get the right voltage going to, you know, this is mainly for the motors, but it works for, for a lot of things. Um, that was about 65 bucks. Uh, multimeter, you got to have one of those to, to test your circuits, particularly when things go wrong. And you're going to have to make wire connections. So I did buy a crimper. I, I, let's see, the multimeter is probably 45, 50 bucks. And the crimper uh, to make the DuPont connections was about uh, uh, 25 bucks, something like that. So anyway, that, that's just a preemptive answer to, to that question. But I know you've got lots of others. And um, just shoot away. Well, first off, Jim, uh, I'm, you know, excellent. I mean, it's, I mean, your skills are clearly shown and took a lot of patience to do that. Um, I'm quite impressed with the outcome. I think you did a great job. Uh, you deserve a lot of credit for that. It's really awesome. That's the determination, you know, little, little yellow balloon there in the psychological stages. I, I'm the kind that, you know, doesn't quit. Uh, you sort of, sort of keep going no matter what goes wrong. And um, yeah, I tested my patients quite a bit. Yeah, but you, only, you, you only got a C. <laughs> no, that well, was in that was in uh, electrical I, I engineering. I know, but and uh, oh my God, what do you have to do to get an A? You can put this together. That's not Tinker Toys. Well, That's what amazes me is you know having taken that that college course. I remember just a little bit about um, you know volts and amps and current and and all that kind of stuff but then all the things dealing with transistors and op amps and or gates and nor gates it, it was the beginning of um the true uh shrinking of digital devices and it was so complicated at that point you, you know uh, now we have literally billions of transistors on the chips that we use in our phones and in our computers. And at that time, you were putting, you know, two or three or five components together and trying to really understand it. And uh, a lot of it's the basis for design of what we really have now. And I didn't understand it at all. It was, I, it was hilarious at that time. I just, I just <laughs> bought, I just took my, I have a new drone. And I just took it up for the first time yesterday for about, I don't know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And it gives me a whole new appreciation of gimbals and whatnot. Yeah. Um, Any of those devices like that, like our, like our cameras, like a drone or a gimbal or, or whatever it is. Um, you know, I think this project taught me, you know, uh, a lot of the rudiments of the kind of thing that, that goes into that for a commercial product. And, uh, 
you know, this is, like I said, I, I build on other people's designs, but I tried to add something to it, you know, particularly that control of time. Uh, the original design, they just had a potentiometer to control time where you're not really controlling time. It's like long, medium, and short. Well, I wanted, you know, 10 seconds or 15 seconds or 23 seconds, you know, to really control it. So um, I didn't mind, you know, copying what other people did, but I wanted to add to it uh, as well. And I think that was, you know, at least moderately successful. Al, what kind of drone did you get? I got a DJI Mini 2. Oh. Um, and uh, I've had it for a while. I just, I, I, I've had just not, to make a difference, but I just I had cataract surgery. Um, oh. oh, so the last few weeks I've been kind of, kind of uh, out of doing much. But and then just I don't know. I just I had stuff going on. I just kind of didn't get around to, to actually flying it. So finally, um, I did everything, and and damn, it was easy. Uh, once I got it, it was fun. I only took about four pictures. I went out to the football field and and flew around a little bit, but uh, it's. It's you're, some amazing stuff. You're allowed to fly them where you live? Uh, well, it depends. <laughs> It'll tell you if I can't. Uh, but this is the country. So, yeah, I went out in the football field and there was nobody out there. Um, well, we've got, a, we've got a video interest group. Maybe we ought to fire up a drone interest I, group. Seriously, yeah. anybody anybody's interested? In, Daryl, didn't you say you got one? Or Oh, yeah, I have a DJI. It's an old one, but what, it flies. What did you do you have one of the bigger ones or what? When you crashed in about 10 seconds. <laughs> well, hey, I didn't lose it. I was I was happy. This one, the only the only thing that this has on it that or excuse me, this doesn't have on it that I wish it did, uh, was it's uh, doesn't have obstacle um, detection. Oh. Uh, so you do have to be careful with that. Yeah. And uh uh, so I've been, you know, a consumer of videos here and, and how to do just, you know, simple yeah. stuff with it. So couldn't, couldn't do anything today, but, uh, you know, but, you want to go out and fly sometime, let's find a waterfall. I, I need to interject. Yeah. Please send your rating three to nine to me through chat, make it private. So yeah. not three God awful, nine excellent. And please don't account for the minor technical problems Jen had that was out of his control. So don't account for that when you're, oh. when you're rating him. Okay. Mike, can I He's put it back to, um, yeah. Just a, let's see. Now I forgot what I was going to say. Okay. Um, I was going to talk a little bit more uh, about video. Um, Do you may interrupt? Go ahead, Pi Ben. Do you have any recommend? Uh, most of the time, you know, video sliders than what we are doing right now in the market itself have a problem with the model of noise. Okay. Do you have any suggestions well, that, how to reduce it? Yeah, uh, in my version two, I'll be the motor noise will cut down to virtually zero. Uh, I'll be using a different um, different motor drivers. They're a little bit more expensive, and a lot of these parts I've already bought. It's I'm working on the user interface to have more functionality. So um, the, this other driver, um, it'll do uh, one thirty second micro stepping, and they build them specifically to be be silent. So, um, you know, if you're doing a time lapse, it doesn't really matter because you can put any sound that you want with it. But of course, if you're doing video and I left that sound in there on purpose, just so you would hear what those motors sound like, you, you, you know, either need to dub other sound over it uh, with the, the current drivers that I have. But I have, uh, you know, better drivers that will drive those motors silently. So. Nice. And uh, you, you could, I think a lot of the I think a lot of the commercial ones, uh, you know, would be pretty silent. But yeah. um, again, you're talking you're talking bucks. And I did want to uh, I, I want more questions, but I wanted to talk just for a, a second about uh, video. Uh, we got into it with, you know, Don's course using the make video that doesn't suck book. And I had no idea that we'd be that much into it and uh, or I'd be that much into it at this point. But over the course of the last year, helped out at church getting the live stream capability going. So. Basically, now we started the middle of June, so we've done uh, 19 or 20 um, sanctuary services to this point. We've done a couple of memorial services. We did the, um, we've done one evening book talk, which was Rick Bragg 
a hilarious book about his bad, bad dog. And, uh, you know, you need to read that, you know, it's, 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 it's very funny. Uh, so that was an hour, all those are hour long things. And then we did the Decatur book festival, which was an all day thing. So we did, you know, roughly five hours total of live streaming with that. So our crew there, myself and the others that work on it now have about 25 hours of live video experience. So, um, with that, you know, taking some time every week, I really want to get, I want to take the, the slider, um, up to the Blue Ridge Parkway and, you know, do more waterfalls, but more just, uh, uh, you know, the mountains and scenery and clouds and all that. So that's kind of, kind of where I'm going personally with that. I'd hope to make that trip earlier, but I ha just haven't made it yet to, to get some of that stuff. More questions? Yes, Jim. Um, I saw that in your initial trials of designs and so on, you were using breadboards for solderless right. connections either directly into the breadboard or through headers into the right. breadboard. But when you got around to really doing it, you were going to boards that had to be soldered. Right. Well, what I'm doing right now on my backlit images project is trying to do a gang charger that will charge the batteries inside each of these light boxes at the same time. Right. And because charging them individually was taking forever. But I've been using breadboards inside my final product or what I think is the final product. And I'm afraid that uh, those solderless connections are not totally reliable. They, they're, they're subject to vibrations and uh, uh, gravity and everything else. Yeah. yeah, a soldered connection is much more solid than... Uh, uh, a breadboard or a plug. And I kind of went middle ground on this. I put a lot of, you know, plug-in connections there just to be able to change things. Um, but, you know, I, if you want to borrow the soldering station, I'm pretty good at soldering now. <laughs> I can help you solder them if you want to. Uh, but, you know, you need to get your design, you know, to where it's not going to change if you solder it because, you know, you can do desoldering, but it's, a, you know, not as easy as soldering. Well, I just think I, I need to back up a little bit and get away from the idea of using breadboards inside my final product and go to soldered connections inside yeah. my final product. Now, the one image I showed where I had the uh, Arduino Uno sitting there and the Arduino Mano on, on top of a uh, circuit board that's not filled in, you can buy a, a board like that that you can just solder onto and you know, and I have to design any board. So, and, you know, cut it to the size that you, that you need. So that's a real good option. Are those the ones with the copper strips on the back? That you um, be either. Or you solder just the wires on the back. Or you could solder wires on the back because they have them both ways. Um, well, and I, I bought some, I, I've bought everything from, Amazon on the net and it's cheap that way and reasonable service and so on, but it's a little hard to understand what you're getting sometimes. Absolutely true. And that's why that's where YouTube comes in and, you know, you try to get the same components the other folks are using or something really close that you, you know, is going to be a good substitute. And um, YouTube is just such a fantastic resource um yeah well i, I can't I, I watched a youtube program or tutorial or two on uh headers on circuit boards and breadboards and guy making a point that the mail to mail headers are worthless you shouldn't even buy them you ought to get male to female and use the female connectors wherever possible well i got some yeah I bought some female header strips and uh, the male end that goes down into the board didn't have long enough legs. It didn't make good contact. It wouldn't hold. You had, you had the wrong kind of connector for the male then because uh, it should make a pretty solid connection. 
but you know, soldering is better than those connectors. So anyway, yeah. uh, different, different questions. Al, we can, we can break that, uh, that quadcopter thing for you. If you <laughs> want to let us play with it a little bit. I'm, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm terrified when I brought it up, it took me a while and I'm in the middle of an empty football field, you know, there's, there's absolutely nothing to hit, but boy, that thing will take off. It yeah. was, it was fun. So yeah, I'm going to, I'm ready. I've been looking, I've been trying so hard to find some, some leaves to peep at. Um, yeah. And it's just, I'm just not having much luck so far. I've been up to Hiawassee and Blue Ridge and Dahlonega and, and some places around here. And uh, anybody know of any, I think about going to Gibbs Garden, but the time I had a chance to go was Monday. They weren't open. Anybody been to Gibbs yet? Yes. I've never been there in my life. I have not. But I any place like that has, that has some open area where you have a pond yeah. or yeah. Uh, a fairly wide stream where you're not, you know, too worried about the overhanging trees and the drones. Seems to me like those would be ideal places I, to. Yeah. I don't uh, know if Gibbs will let you. What, Gibbs will let I don't, you fly I don't think Gibbs allows Gibbs, that. But Gibbs, Gibbs could probably wouldn't. I could, I could see that. Yeah. But um, the, I mean, it's not in a, it's not an official no fly zone. You know, it have to be a Gibbs policy of some sort. Right. Uh, and at least I don't believe it is, you know, unless it's close to an airport somewhere. I don't think so. Uh, so. I, think that, I think that Gibbs would be very concerned with personal injury liability. And that would be one reason to not let people fly drones on their park. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think well, the maybe. people are flying in any, just any kind of any particular reason. To, I mean, any reason to not fly drones. It's like that's the default position is no um, for a lot of places. But. Uh, there's plenty of places I can go. That's you, when we mentioned Cochrane Mill. Is that is that the one? That's the uh, one that we went to for the field trip. Uh, yeah, I, I went the day after you guys did. I think. Okay. Yeah, because the info uh, is, is still on Meetup. If you if you do want to find it or whatever. Yeah. There was somebody flying a drone there uh, when I was there, um, and no SWAT team came out of the woods or anything. No. During the week, there's very few people out there, but on the weekend, it is mobbed, yeah. uh, like, a, like a lot of parks, you know, during during COVID. So yeah. it would be great if you're a voyeur, peering people's windows and look inside, and not have to take yeah. one of those digital tours. And I'm just is, kidding. Is it too early for the leaf color, or is it just a bad year? I hope it's, it's too early. early. It, it depends it's, on elevation and latitude. Up in North Carolina right now, I mean, you're the peak colors are well off the peaks and, you know, getting down in the valleys now. So it, it all depends on where you are. Al, I, I mean, I'm in Indiana right now. And of course we're way north of you. And this is the latest in my lifetime I've ever seen so many green leaves on the trees. Lisa and I changed here and we're in Indiana. It's supposed to be late this year in general. It just stayed warmer longer. Real, well, um, real late this year. This is a record. I've never seen so many leaves on the trees this time of year ever in my lifetime. But I'm seeing, I'm seeing patches that are <clears throat> great. I'm seeing a tree here and there that's great. But in terms of, you know, uh, you know, some section where they're where they're all lit up, uh, no. Just can't can't find them. I think it's gonna be two weeks at least. If where you are in here, it's probably gonna be enough. Frankly, here it looks to me like at least maybe another week before there's any real a lot of color. Yeah. Gennaro, more, Gennaro, are you still on? Is Gennaro still on? I wanted to ask you a question. Yeah, uh, I'm still on. Yeah, I mean, you you must be pretty <coughs> impressed by the design of my electronics enclosure. Uh, I mean, you know, you're you're pretty well going going ooh gaga over that. So. Um, you know, please give me a good laugh right now. I mean, <laughs> no, I'm just so tired. I'm still working. Um, yeah, but the only thing I would suggest is uh, if you do it again, uh, have some, uh, you know, have your cables kind of tie wrapped or you shrink wrap around a lot of them. Yeah, it'll I'll definitely neat, do that. It'll, it'll neat up. It'll, it'll make the time, your uh, installation a lot neater. I got to hooking it all together. I was just too lazy to get the cables the right length and, and put them in groups and stuff like, yeah. like you're, you're doing. So I said, I want this sucker to work. I've been working on this for five months, you know, and I was like, I want it to work. So I just, whatever cables I had, I just plugged it in and went and it worked. 
<laughs> and just shoved him in there, right? Just shoved him in the box. Yep. It looked great to me. It was very artistic, very abstract there, Jim. Yeah. Jim, yeah. one quick question, please. Sure. What's the, load, what's the load capacity of uh, your slider can handle? Oh. I don't know exactly. And that's another improvement I'm going to make. The Z-axis motor, uh, I can get that to slip by putting a big enough lens on there and, you know, pointing it at a, at a big enough, big enough angle. So I have uh, another motor that's geared that'll give me, I think, a, a eight to one ratio. So it'll give me a, quite a bit more torque. Um, I didn't calculate those torques, but, you Your know. Your slider it, can handle only horizontal, right? Cannot handle vertical. Um, it has a mechanical mechanism on there. So that if you set the, um, that X axis that would normally be horizontal at an angle, you can move the carriage and put it at an angle where it's level. That mechanism does not work uh, very well. It's, it, it doesn't tighten down uh, enough to really hold it. Uh, you know, small angles like, you know, Five or ten degrees, you can, I understand. You can get it most to of the time, most of the time, it's going yeah. to be you know cannot handle. Most of the time, it's going to be as close to horizontal as you can get it because you want that. Um, if you're doing a um, a video or you know you want your your camera to be horizontal, so um, 